So first of all, um, it's going to be a little complicated sort of explaining tefillah to this group because some of you have had in classes already. Some of you I've spoken to about these different things. Some of you have never been in any of my classes. And so there's a few different types of people here. And so uh, what I decided to do, the options were try to do like a crash course introduction, which I, that was one option. Other option number two was just sort of approach the whole topic from a totally different angle. And so I decided to go with option number two, and I want to just sort of um, introduce you to a few uh, other concepts, I guess we could say, that are going to build us towards tefillah. What I usually do when I talk about tefillah is I just talk about tefillah sort of like directly. And I think that in a certain way, by doing that, I'm sort of playing into the problem. Because I think the problem with tefillah is that people um, view it as, a, as an isolated idea in a certain sense. It's kind of like there's a thing called tefillah. There are certain perspectives about it that are somewhat distorted and usually revolves around, are we asking God for things? You know, what's the point of doing that? Hashem always knows what, what you're supposed to have anyway, so why ask? And, um, and are you supposed to get things that you ask for? How exactly does that work? And these are some of the questions that are asked about the tefillah concept in isolation. But I think that talking about it that way, aside from the fact that it's also going to be difficult in this group, but it's also, um, it feeds into the problem, which is the problem with tefillah is that it's viewed in an isolated way, mainly because we, um, we interact with tefillah in a sort of isolated way. Because tefillah is a very big thing in our uh, societies, in our current Jewish social uh, groupings, because a lot of the, especially outside of Israel, um, a lot of our Jewish life revolves around the shul, and the shul is supposed to be predominantly about tefillah, although it often ends up not really being about that. Uh, we're going to talk about that. It's often a lot more about social connections, um, but um, that sort of makes tefillah its own thing. And then, of course, I think I mentioned other, other classes like this one, um, that's one of the big problems with tefillah is, like, how do you even do it well? Like, how do you have kavana tefillah? It sounds like it's, like, very hard to do. Uh, people don't understand what they're saying and they don't connect to it a lot of times. There's all kinds of different uh, struggles with that problem. And it's an old struggle, hundreds of years old already. post game we're talking about people have a hard time actually having Kavana and Tefillah and how to even say Shmona Esrei, like to the point where this is one of my, you know, just a classic example, like, um, you know, the first three brachos of Shmona Esrei, you're supposed to say them with, at least the first brachos will say with Kavana. So the halacha is if you don't say the first bracha of Shmona Esrei with Kavana, you need to start over. So the problem is that if you then say it a second time without kavana, you need to start over another time. To the point where the post given the Achronim say that, like the Ramah is the most famous one, but a lot of posts can talk about how you just don't ever do that. Like what you do is you just say the first time, you don't say with kavana, you just keep going because no one knows how to have kavana anymore. Hundreds of years ago, people didn't know how to have kavana anymore. And so just give up. So that's uh, a crazy thing, just to give up on that, like it's wild. So we're gonna try to approach this from a completely different angle. And so see if we can sort of undo some of that and uh, do something a little bit different. So um, I want to start off by creating a sort of theoretical scenario. I want you to imagine what it would be like to be kadosh to Hashem in a static way, in a way that is unchanging. I'll tell you what I mean by that. First of all, what does it mean to be kadosh to Hashem? What does it mean to be kadosh in general? So to be kadosh, the, the, simple translation of the word kadosh means to be dedicated towards, focused towards, directed towards, purposed towards something or someone, okay? So just to sort of do that in a relatively quick way, um, you know, hektesh means things that are dedicated to the base of mikdash, in other words, the house that is Hashem's house in the world. Um, a kadesha is somebody who is dedicated towards either sexual interaction or the money that she's making through the sexual interaction, that's her whole job. Um, Kadesh is particularly fascinating and when I teach this as a, an isolation. Um, Kadesh is just, it's a funny uh, eye in the, fly in the ointment because it's kind of like, well, Kadesh does not sound like it should mean holy. If you like to teach the word color, should mean holy. A Kadesh means a prostitute. She's somebody who is getting paid simply to experience a sexual action in a transactional setting. So Rashi in uh, Parshas Vayesha, when he talks about the Kadesh that Tamar dresses up as, so he mentions there how, um, that, why is she, she called a Kadesha? Because she's Mikudeshes umizumenes leznus. In other words, she is set aside and, and purposed for, her whole purpose is essentially to engage in sexual activity that is purely for the sensation of it as opposed to, to any kind of connective background to it. So the language there is essentially she is purposed for that. That's also the word Kadesh for a man is the same thing. Um, and another possible understanding is also that the word Kadesha means that she is so dedicated to the money in terms of the transaction that she doesn't get any involvement, she doesn't get sidetracked by the relationship component that usually is present in a sexual setting. 
She doesn't get sidetracked to that in any way. She just continues going for the money and she is purposed towards that and does not deviate. So that's why she is called a Kadesha because the word Kadosh means to be dedicated to something for something. And what's crazy about that example is that it shows you it doesn't have to be something which is positive. It's something to do with being holy. I don't know what holy means. Um, my translation of holy usually definitionally means that something which is filled with holes. That is the English translation and explanation of the word holy. Filled with holes. I don't think there's another one. Um, so given that, so if you are in a relationship with another person, usually it's lovers. We have, there's, there's, a, there's a world of what we call lovers. Um, lovers are two people who are sexually committed to each other. Um, they commit themselves. They use a certain, they basically undergo a, 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 a ceremony that basically says they're committing themselves to each other in that way. The ceremony of commitment is called kedushin from the word kadosh, and they're basically dedicating themselves to each other in terms of their sexual relationship. There's some complexity there in terms of male versus female, but we'll leave that alone for now. But basically, um, when two people enter into that kind of relationship, which is called kedushin, so then something happens. And I want to talk about what happens there, and then we can talk about this theoretical imaginary scenario where you are kadosh to Hashem in a static, meaning an unchanging version of that. What would that actually be like? Okay, so in a relationship, so it's never static. So that's why I wanted to sort of give you the, the static idea in theory. So um, the, we'll look at that comment in a second. I'm kind of curious what that says, but I can't open it without switching around my whole screen. Um, so how do we get rid of that? Oh shit, it's really distracting. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so when two people get married, um, the English term for that, for Kedushin and Nesuin, so what happens is there's sort of like, I remember when I first did this, my example I used to always use a lot when I got married was um, I'd be on the bus and uh, I, f I would say like my wife's with me and I'd be like in the store and my wife is with me and like, and, on a, and it's a very vague way of saying it like, oh, the person is just with you. I think a better way to sort of say it is like the presence of the other person sort of colors the background of your mind. In other words, they're kind of there in the background and like you could think of it almost as like a whiteboard and like they're the white and then whatever's going on in your day like you're writing things on that board it's like you're going shopping or you're learning or you have a chavrusa or you're at your job like that's all being written on top of that background but the, there's a background hum or like a background color that's kind of like behind everything and that's 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 her presence and then it's just kind of always there now what's interesting about that if, if you think about like well what would it mean to be kadosh to that person, right? If you want to operate bikdusha towards your spouse, what that means is that all the things that you're writing on the board, they kind of are directed towards the other person in some form, right? Like, so if I'm working in my job, so, and my job is in some way, I'm writing that on the board of my relationship. So like in some form, I have this awareness that the background of my job is her, is that relationship. To the point that it's like, well, if you ask me, why am I working this job? So at the root of it, well, a big part of it at least, is, well, it's about my relationship with her. It's like, well, I'm working the job minimally at least, at least to, to pay the things that I need to pay in order to support my family or to build my family or things like that. So that's sort of like a way that my job could be kadoshified towards that relationship. Now, what's tricky about that is like, or what's important about that, maybe I shouldn't say tricky, what's important about that is that you're, you, there's a few different types of things you can write on that board. You can, or really two different types of things. You can write um, actions, activities, like things that you're doing in your life, and those are able to be kadoshified towards that relationship. Or you could also have thoughts. In other words, the kinds of things that you think about that can be kadoshified towards that relationship. And so those two types of things, what's called machshavos and masim, actions and, and thoughts, so that, that exists in the kadushin space. Now, that's all kind of like the, the beginning of a framework here. And we're going to bring it back towards Hashem in a, in a couple of minutes, but just to sort of keep that alive as, as a framework, I want us now kind of go a little bit deeper underneath that. So underneath all of that in that relationship whiteboard, so remember, like, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just point out, like your relationship with your spouse is never going to be the biggest whiteboard that you have. All that will be on an even larger whiteboard, which is going to be the Hashem relationship. But we're going to talk about that after when we get towards Hashem. But in terms of your relationship with your spouse, a Kedushan relationship, so you have this relationship background and the things that you decide to put there that are going to be, that can be Kedoshified towards that person. In other words, dedicated to or purposed towards that relationship. So the thing is that underneath all of that, 
there's like the actual relationship itself, the white part of the board. Okay, so the white part of the board, you could think of that essentially as like the awareness that you have of the relationship. You can think of almost like how, how intense or how present is your awareness of the white part of the board? Because the tricky thing about whiteboards and anything which is a background hum is that it can fade into the background or into the foreground, you know, when you, if you, you can start paying attention to the white on the whiteboard, it can even become distracting. Similar to set, like a background hum, you know, if someone points out a background hum, that can be very annoying, at least for the short term until you get distracted because you just notice it a lot and then you can't get, you can't stop noticing it once someone shows it to you. So same thing is true with the whiteboard background, which is the relationship background that's there. You can bring that more into the foreground or it can fade more into the background in terms of your awareness. Okay. So, I want to give some words to describe that background, and then you can sort of understand a little more how we're going to be connecting these ideas. The background, when it first begins, when you first form that background, when you first do Kedushin and get married, so the word we're going to use for that is the word Keter. Now, for those of you who are in my Keter classes the last couple of times, um, you can try to make the connections. Hopefully, you'll be able to do it on your own. I'm going to do a little bit of it right now, but we're not going to spend too much time showing how it's the same thing. Uh, maybe later, as we get more towards the Tefillah components, you'll see how this is the same thing. And from, what we're doing now is a, 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 a trick I like to do where you come to the same concept from a different direction. And sometimes it can be a little bit confusing, but what it does to your mind is awesome because it sort of trains you to start taking ideas and flipping them and starting to see them in 3D, which uh, is a very important thing to do. It's called being lovesh, the idea, putting, trying the idea on inside your mind, and that allows you to really um, operate it much more effectively and know how to apply it and use it. So... We're going to call that background in its, in its initial formation. When you first decide to form that background, in other words, you make the decision to create the relationship with the other person, we're going to call that Keter. Now, you can think of Keter as kind of like the potential. In other words, like, okay, I'm making the decision to create the relationship, but you didn't create it yet. You just sort of had the decision to do that, the impulse, the volition to create the relationship. And then what you do is you start doing all kinds of actions and thoughts those same two things that you can put onto the whiteboard. And those things, what they'll do is they start creating feedback loops where you'll do an action and it'll take that initial decision and start to actualize it. Okay, so what you're doing now is you're taking that initial keter, that initial ratzon, that initial wanting that, that you just initiated, and now you're reinforcing it by taking action. So it's an example, right? Like, you know, whether you, you could think of it as like um, you, uh, you, so you just got married, just did the condition. We're going to skip some of the dating phases here just to make it relatively really simple. It's just like the timeline is decided to, to create condition. Now you're together. And so now you have a, a life together. And then it's like, okay, so you, um, you go and take out the garbage or you decide to vacuum the apartment or, you know, you buy flowers. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking things that I, that I would do. And then as you do each of those things, and you also like those things also can be coupled with thinking thoughts about the relationship or about, about her. And like those things start to create feedback loops because what happens is that initial potential of the idea of the relationship, the relationship background that you formed in the beginning, suddenly as you start to act on it in that way, it becomes emphasized, it becomes enhanced, it becomes expanded. In other words, it becomes actualized. And that white background that at first was just kind of like a white background now is like more experienced. It's more present. It's more encountered in your, in your experience. The word for that, when you experience it in that way, is called a da'at. It is a singular, like one of the, the category in plural is called de'ot. Uh, we'll translate it as perceptions for now, but we're not going to leave the, we're going to not use the translation so much at this, at this particular point. But what you're, but what da'at is, also known as das in the yeshiva world, um, das means essentially the actualization of something which was there in potential, of a keter that was there in potential, a ratzon, a thread of wanting, an impulse that was there in potential, when it gets actualized through thoughts or through actions or through both, so then it now becomes a dea, an actual perception. Now, what that means, sort of just think how that works. Okay, so now when you, you let's say you did that, you know, you bought her flowers. And then the next, the next day, I mean, there's, there's millions of them. Like there's so many, de, oh, there's so many um, experiences that enhance or increase the das that you have. So like, you know, the next morning, I don't know, you wake up, do the dishes or know, just are just talking to each other, listening to each other, um, you know, telling each other that you love each other. These are all different things that you can do and think that are all kind of essentially going to build more experiences that take that background hum and make it more present inside of your life. 
Similarly, you can also do the opposite of that. You can starve deot. You can take a particular perceptual lens and you can operate in ways that essentially shove it back into the background. You can neglect that thing, that background framework, and then cause it to fade out. So we're going to expand on that in a second a little more. But the point that I'm trying to stress right now is that what you're really doing is you start off by essentially creating from scratch a particular de'a, and then you feed it in these ways until it becomes more and more and more and more present in your background consciousness. Okay, now, the, so the, the, like the reason why, I'm tr why I also threw in the translation of perceptions is because what I want you to realize is that there's actually a lot of different deot in any person. Every, I mean, each, each, every relationship that you have, every, every aspect of your life that is sort of like a experiential aspect in some way forms this gigantic patchwork of a whiteboard where there are certain parts that are more prominent, certain parts that are less prominent. You know, it's like people that you think about more, experiences that are more significant. If you had a very intense experience in which you almost, you know, uh, got injured and were traumatized, that could be a very prominent suddenly piece of the patchwork background whiteboard that you have that's very prominent. I tried to start off with just one example, one relationship, one experience. Um, but basically, there is always an underlying wanting of some kind. And then there's accumulations of layers of, ex of, of actions and thoughts that bring that underlying wanting into actuality. And then it starts to actually become a way that you see things. So when I said before, like my wife is with me as I'm, you know, doing whatever it is that I'm doing. So, you know, you, the, the idea there's someone who is just the background, the presence is kind of just there in the background. So that's actually a perception. In other words, there's a certain way of seeing reality and you can actually, like, you can make that become stronger and stronger. You can also create false perceptions, by the way. You know, if you have a fantasy of some kind about somebody, uh, there's all kinds of movies made out of things like this, but they take particular, it's, they, you know, they make it into a joke. People do this for real, where, like, you actually have a particular idea about a particular person. I'll give an example. I don't know, it's not some movie where they have a, you know, a person who's in love with another person and thinks that the other person is into them, but really they're not. And it's like, you know, they make comedies out of that because what's happening is it's like, we all know, it's like, well, you could have this perception which is built out of experiences that you perceive as being on top of an underlying wanting. And that perception is completely out of sync with what's actually going on in the actual empirical reality that you live in, which is the outside world. So what you're doing is you're building a perception at, on top of these things with these experiences, and it accumulates into a more and more thickened dea, a particular way of seeing reality, and it becomes thicker and thicker, and then you just start to see things that way. So, and then, you know, when, when things ultimately clash with it, when you are exposed at the climax of the movie with the fact that that was never a real thing, that's when it gets hilarious because the clash of two things that don't fit together in life are viewed as what we call humor. And as long as you're not empathizing with somebody who's experiencing that clash, you will laugh at that. Of course, to analyze what laughter is, but we're not going to do that right now. Um, the point is that that is what a day a is. That's how it's structured with this background hum that can come more into the foreground and more into the background as a result of your investment of actions or thoughts. And that's what's called a day a. And so that's basically the analogy in terms of the Kedushin marriage situation. We're going to bring that now into the Hashem side of things and sort of show you what that is. Um, Isaac, is that a quick question? Yeah, very quick, actually. You, is there a difference between a thought and an action? Um, there is a difference. We're going to come to that soon. Okay. We, will, we will get to that. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Um, so continuing to build this. So essentially, what, when we talk about de oath in this way, um, like I said, there, you could have so many, like right now we have 13 participants in the Zoom session. So that means there are essentially 13 different um, background pieces in mics, or 12, because I'm one of them. Well, I guess that would also count. Um, there's 13 different experiential elements just within this little setting that, are, that I'm currently building on. So I know each of you in some form and from different contexts and different ways. And then what I'm doing now is I'm essentially building my experience of you and therefore my perception of you uh, on top of the initial, when I first met you, first started to get a sense of who you were, I'm building that out now. And then my interaction with you is essentially going to be a function of my perception. And then as I, so those things, you see how they build, right? Like the more, the more, um, ex, the more actions, the more experiences that, that we, that I deploy in my interaction with you, the more my, my perception will become solidified or will evolve or mutate towards whatever new things happen. So like, let's say I taught you in high school 
um, and then now I'm encountering you in a post high school setting. So now I'm encountering you in a new way. So my perception and experience of you is now mutating in a certain way. Now, if I decided to relate to you as a high school student right now, that'd be very weird, right? Let's say I was like, oh, so isn't it so weird how like we have no school right now? And like for those of you who are in my class in high school, it's like that would just be like, you wouldn't understand what I was even saying. It just wouldn't fit. And the reason for that is because it's like, how, how did you not upgrade the perception that you had based on the new data? Like there's new information and experiences here that you're not adding to the day. Ah, so what's happening in that situation is um, I'm failing to feed that perceptual lens properly. And therefore it starts to essentially distort away from the reality on the ground. Okay. So that's basically what can happen. You can actually, you can feed a, a perception things that are going to cause it to shift or mutate. You want to feed it things that are going to cause it to objectively become more accurate. But you can also accidentally or intentionally feed it things that will cause it to become less accurate, more distorted, and less um, reflective of what's really going on. Okay, so that's pretty much like um, puzzle piece number one. And the, the background picture of that whole puzzle piece is what we call being kadosh on top of all of that. Because after we have the structure of how they all work, when you decide to operate within a particular relationship, you know, patchwork piece from that big patchwork of all your all your different um, day oath when you decide to take your actions or your thoughts or both and direct them towards that particular the feeding we'll say of that relationship that's called basically operating with kedusha towards that relationship because what you're doing is you're now purposing the things you're doing towards it so if i if i talk to one of you when i called an izzy before so i'm talking to him directly and i'm now purposing my comments towards him directly. So I start to feel a little bit of a shift in the situation because now instead of talking to all of you, I was like, should I pause now? Because I'm supposed to be talking to everybody, but like, let me just zoom in for a second. I'm going to direct words. I'm going to kadoshify things directly to that particular patchwork piece. And now it's going to shift my relationship with him in a very tiny way. But like, I'm basically going to do that kind of kadoshifying dynamic towards him. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be, you know, a brief moment of that and then pull back and then try to juggle all of you and try to do that all at once. So that's what being kadosh essentially means. Um, in terms of a particular, um, you know, background setting like that. And so when you operate in a Kadosh way, you are essentially feeding a Dei, you're essentially expanding a perception, you're essentially, um, you're nourishing it, you could think of it like that. And then that, that kind of causes now that that perception will be almost more vibrant in the background of your mind. So again, like with the spouse example, the reason why it's such a good idea to do that is that um, it's something which then brings the relationship much more um, prominently into your consciousness. That's going to be where we're going to focus significantly in a second. I just want to now weave in Izzy's question from a second ago um, in terms of thoughts versus actions. So you think about the qualitative difference between those two things when you actually try to build a relationship with somebody in, in, the, in, your, in your day of them. So when I do actions, what's interesting about that is actions are something that you can do relatively easily and make them look like you're actually feeding the day of and you're expanding it and enhancing it, but they actually might be detached from the underlying piece, the underlying hum, the underlying background um, that's there, the underlying de'ah that's there, they could be detachment, right? But they call, we call that being fake or being duplicitous, right? So let's say um, you buy flowers for your spouse, um, you know, a guy buys flowers for his wife, and then um, he does that like a bunch of weeks in a row, and then after he does it, I don't know, like, 10 weeks in a row, 20 weeks in a row, two years. And then at a certain point, it's like, it starts to feel like the underlying relationship is no longer being expanded. In other words, that, that whiteboard, the white you know, uh, energy is, or, the white, or the white presence is not becoming more prominent by doing that because the action of giving the flowers is no longer actually causing that to happen. And the reason is because he's not linking on the inside. He's not connecting the action that he's doing on the outside to the underlying uh, perception that he has on the inside. So that's what's tricky about actions. They're qualitatively different from thoughts because they're external and they can be done without being uh, linked to the underlying they are that's there. And you go a little further, then you start thinking about the nature of thoughts. Like thoughts are kind of interesting because thoughts are inside of you. It's hard to really, like, it's unlike if you are going to be faking thoughts. You could lie to yourself inside of your thinking. Some people definitely do that. Um, but there's a different way to sort of think about thoughts. Thoughts generally are much harder to fake than actions. It's much, in other words, it's much harder to sever them from the underlying dea that's there. And so if you have a thought in your mind, it's usually coming from some kind of connection to an underlying dea. 
So like if you are, if you have a relatively strong day of, you know, a perception of connection between you and your spouse, then it's fair to assume that you'll have a significant amount of thoughts, a high percentage of thoughts in your mind will be a function of that. I'll even, I'll say it like this. Let's say you had three different patches in your day puzzle. You had your spouse, you had your job, and then you had, I don't know, your, your, your food relationship. Let's say you love food. There's millions of them, but let's just pick three. So let's say that, the, that you've invested in your food relationship um, a significant amount, so now we'll say of the patchwork dynamic, the energy of the food part is like, let's say 60% of the whole patchwork. And then let's say the spouse is going to be uh, 30%. And then you have 10% left for your boss at your job. So now you have, right, you have 60% food, 30% uh, four, spouse, and 20, sorry, 20, no, yeah, 10% boss. That comes out to 100%. That's your whole world of, of, of perceptions. Now, which thing is going to dominate your thinking the most? Because since you have 60% of your day of your DAS essentially is founded in or, or vibrating in the frequency of, of food, then you're going to find yourself when you're daydreaming, like about 60% of your thoughts will be about food. And then another 30% of your thoughts will be about your spouse. And 10% of your thoughts will be about your job. And what's interesting about that is the thoughts are kind of the opposite of actions. Actions are kind of external and they're a little bit almost like going inwards and you can decide to sever them from your inside perceptions. But thoughts... You can actually use your thoughts as a tool to actually trace what your underlying deot are. You look at your thoughts, you can figure out, well, how do I actually perceive reality? What do I, what do I think about in my downtime? Like, where, where, I, where do I find myself? And here's what that kind of will lead to. You can get an idea of what you're actually kadosh to the most. Like, what do you feed the most in terms of your different um, deot that you have? What do you give the most to? What do you invest the most into um, based on the things that you think about the most? So if you space that when you're spacing out, you're thinking about, I don't know, um, the Tiger King. There we go. That's a popular thing right now. Um, so that's what you're thinking when you're spacing out. Then that means that right now you fed the perceptual, you know, the, the original impulse was, I'm interested in this thing. You feed that by watching it. Then you talk about it with your friends. And then, you know, you're, that, especially today, it happens to be a very popular thing. Um, I, uh, I have not watched it. I refuse to watch it. It looks like it's too, too silly. Um, I'll be honest. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that, but I'm going to leave that alone. Um, but I'm just going to say that when you do watch it, then you also, you also allocate time to speak about it with other people. And you also experience all kinds of involvement in that conversation with passion and whatever. So then what you're doing is a little bit of tefillah now to that world of, of Dea of the Tiger King. You're actually, uh, developing that perception intensively, very intensely. And so that could, that, that means that when you space out, it could be that somebody was even spacing out thinking about it while I was talking. Listen, in a class, someone talks a lot. So you're sitting there, you definitely have plenty of opportunity to, to go into dreamland a little bit. And if that's, you know, whatever it is that you spaced out about, that's something which is interesting to you. And it's because the perception of it is relatively uh, developed, has been fed significantly. Okay, so that's all a framework that I constructed all that in kind of like a nice English language. Um, it's something which is, uh, you know, I'm just describing it, but all of what I just said is coming straight from different statements of Chazal that are all in reference to Hashem. And I just, and they also are a reference to our connections with each other, but I constructed them on purpose from the, in the reverse way. I wanted to show you first the people version of that and sort of really wake it up and tidy a little bit before I show it to you in the Torah side, in the Chazal side, and in, in the Hashem side. So I want to sort of first show you one interesting piece here that is, uh, this is quoted in the Nefshah Chaim. A lot of, there's a whole section in Shar Bey's Nefshah Chaim. There's a whole uh, gigantic essay about the, air, the, the area of what we call feeding Hashem, okay? Talking about being kadosh, um, essentially like whenever you're, again, within a particular perception, you're operating towards that and it then, it then builds more das layers on top of it and expands that perception. So the same thing is true exactly with Hashem and, and when you do with Hashem. So the thing about Hashem is that the perception of Hashem's um, presence, like when you marry Hashem, which we're gonna have to talk about when that happens. I don't know if we'll get to that in this class, but um, that the, the background hum of all of your being, okay? It's, it's hard to see it. It's easier to see it. I, I could spend a whole class trying to show you how to see this background hum because the way to show it to you is to first take it away. If I could take it away for a couple minutes and have you imagine an existence without the background hum of Hashem's being, the way that we had the same background hum 
of the whiteboard and of my wife and of your, you know, any friend or you know, like whatever it is. So whenever I teach the, the way to experience that, I have to first rip out parts of you. I got to be like, okay, here, if you lose this part, look, now there's something missing. What was that thing? Well, you were so used to it. Like, what if we rip out this part? And we can rip out a lot of different parts of your life. And if people, at, you know, whenever there's tragedies, you have some experiences of that. You know, God forbid when somebody loses a loved one, that's actually a, a little fragment of, of, um, of the experience of if we ripped out all of the background, the totality of your, of your patchwork um, quilt that's back there. And then the big picture, that entire quilt going from the outside all the way in um, of, your, of like your particular background quilt is what we'll call Hashem. So that presence of Hashem is all, is full, it's there in a very intense way. It's just very backgrounded, very hard to encounter without, again, being taught how to do that. There's actually a great book about this. Um, it's called The Torah. The Torah is the book about how to actually access that perspective. Unfortunately, it's usually taught as a religion, so I can't really uh, speak to that because I don't know what religion is, but I know what the Torah is, and the Torah is that. So the reason I'm saying that, and I'm sorry if I, I, I can't, I can't hold back, I gotta say it, you know, um, is that um, the same tools apply. You are structured in what's called a shiur koma, the same exact, or also known as tzel melokim, the same structure of tools that you use to interact with other selves and to build the deot of each other and what we call connections. So that also is true to you and Hashem. And so to be kadosh la Hashem, which is the mitzvah of Parshas Kedoshim, um, which is usually translated as holy in that context because it's something to do with God or religion. But to be kadosh la Hashem means that now you are taking, since the, since the background, the whiteboard of your entire life is Hashem. And there's, that's why Hashem is called the makom. There's no, there's no context where it's not Hashem. The analogy I like to use for this is like if you imagine a person in your mind or if you imagine a book, right? So let's say, imagine you were a character in a book. So if you're a character in a book, so I usually use Harry Potter for this because I find that amusing. Um, if you're a character in Harry Potter, so um, there is no place inside that story where J.K. Rowling is not there. Um, what would be really crazy if she could actually start talking to you in the book. That, that's, there's actually a Stephen King book like that where he uh, interacts with his own characters. Um, and that's really, it's obviously very bizarre, but that's literally what, what's going on here. Um, so if you have a book where you're a character in that book, everything inside the book is made out of the mind of the, of the author. There is no place that is not the author. You can go from here, you can go to ShopRite, you know, you can go to, to Israel. Like there is no place where you're not still inside. You can't escape the mind of the author because you're, you're, you're in it. You're a, a product of it. You're a fabric of it. There's nowhere to go that isn't that. That's what the Gemara means in, in Masechus Baruchos when it calls Hashem the Makom. He is the context. So every, if, if the whole reality is that, and the background essentially is Hashem's presence in that way, and again, we have to show that in, a, in a, an experiential way, but not going to do that now. Um, well, then if you're going to be kadosh la Hashem, what that means is that in some way, almost anything that you do can be direct, no, not, any, not almost, anything that you do can be directed towards Hashem, can be kadoshified towards Hashem in some way. And I don't mean that you can be really from and you can fit into a societal perspective of what it means to be religious. I don't mean that you should follow what people tell you to do. I mean that you have to understand there's actual true ways of taking everything about your life and dedicating it to something which is insanely wildly out there, much bigger than what we can, than what we're even used to thinking. We just think of, I, I feel bad saying this, but we say that God is a guy in the sky that kind of kills it because it's like, that's so little, a guy in the sky, it's nothing. But you think about like what, what Hashem actually is and what it means in terms of how, where, where you are relative to him. So you can actually take all these different aspects of your life and weave them towards something. And by the way, anything that you experience in your life where you experience intense joy means that you're doing that by accident, perhaps. I might not know that you're doing it, but as an example, let's say you find your calling in life. You know that you're meant to be a, an interior decorator. And you really just do that and you, you get off on it so much. It just really makes you, it makes you high. You know, it's like, you're so happy doing it. You feel like you're in the right place, the right time channeling who you're supposed to be into the world. That's what we call Simcha, by the way. So then you're, uh, th th that means that you are now channeling somehow Hashem's like being that he wants you to be ex expressing into the world. You're doing that effectively when you're an artist, you know, or, or a musician, people who are in the middle of channeling intense artwork in that way. That's what you're doing. You're literally translating Hashem's presence into the world. And again, a lot to talk about with that, but just the point is that the, very, the, the ultimate background, the ultimate day out that's in the background is the Hashem one, and then you can take anything and feed it towards that and enhance that. Okay, so the example I wanted to show you, there's a, this is a statement from, um, from the, 
um, from the Zohar, which, uh, again, I'm just going to give you a little excerpt here, but basically, um, um, Kodesh Yisrael Hashem, that basically um, Yisrael is Kadosh Hashem. They're about Hashem in this way. We, were the, we, we decided that we're essentially doing Kedushin with Hashem, and we're going to make our lives about this. Um, again, this is the end of Perak Vav in Shar Beis Nefesh Chaim, if you want to see it quoted, in the, but it's from the Zohar, the Raya Mahemna. So it writes there, the Yisrael Nikru Ilan Gadol Vechazak. And the Yisrael are called a, a, a very strong and powerful tree, a big tree. Um, and Umazel Nechol Lechol Bo. And they provide um, sustenance for everything else. This tree that sort of like provides fruit that feeds everything. Boa Torah she mazon lamal. So the Torah, which is the mazon, which is the sustenance for that which is above. Boa tefila she mazon also, and, and, and tefila, which is also mazon. It goes through different mitzvot. Tefila malachim ain't la mazon el alidei Israel. Even the malachim, they only get their their mazon. In other words, their sustenance um, through bnei Israel. So mazon um, essentially means like you could think of it as like something which is giving it. It's, it's energizing it. So if you go back to our analogy of our, of our relationships, so what's happening is when, you, when, we, when we invest, when we do things towards each other, so what it does is it, it brings the background to life. Now, you're gonna, in the Nefshechaim, in, in the same sources that are all over the Nefshechaim, all the statements of Chazal, it's in the same, in the same shahr, he, he taught. investing in it. So if you are kadoshifying, you're at, oh, you can't hear me? You gotta go back a couple seconds. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay, so it froze for a second? Okay, sorry, because usually the problem is that we have um, a loss of hearing. Um, yeah, so what we're saying is that, that um, Hashem, like Hashem's presence doesn't actually change objectively, but your de'a of this can change. That background whiteboard that you have, your De'a of Hashem, can change. And so if you decide to invest in it and you're feeding it, so B'nai Yisrael, according to what the Zohar is saying, are essentially, that's what we're doing here. Like our whole existence is what we do is we do, we learn Torah, and Torah essentially is thoughts that are feeding. In other words, we're dedicating our thoughts towards Hashem. We're, we're thinking thoughts that are deep, that are accurate, that are true about existence. And then, of course, when you think thoughts like that, what's supposed to happen next is you speak thoughts like that, and then you also live in a way that expresses that, and that creates this feedback loop where now you're thinking, saying, and, ex and expressing those types of ways of, of, of thinking, and that feeds back onto the experience, onto the, onto the das of Hashem, and makes that more powerful inside of you. And not only does it do that, it also causes all the people, like there's now 14 people in this group, like if I'm doing my job well, which I'm trying to, um, then everyone in the group is now also absorbing true ideas, thinking about them like, oh, wow, I never thought about it that way, or that's really interesting, or that sounds really true, or that really changes the way I think about this. Or, and then that feed, feeds back into the things that you're going to say and the way that you're going to talk about Torah or talk about your relationships or the, and the way that you're going to behave. And all those things are now making you more vibrancy in the presence of Hashem, in the background of your being, each of us, by going through these types of things. And we're just feeding that. And so that's like, that's what Yisrael as a group is really supposed to be doing. And then just to throw in what he says about the malachim, just to understand what that means. Malachim just means the, in the mechanics of Hashem's process of expressing himself as the universe that you, that you see around you. So basically Hashem sort of takes himself and puts himself through a series of stages that almost like, we'll use this crazy word, but he fragments himself into like little fragments. Each of those fragments sort of plays a role in the construction process. That's what malachim are. They are essentially little fragments of consciousness that are slightly different from our fragments of consciousness. But basically what we're doing is when we decide to operate in a way that enhances or, in, or feeds the perception of Hashem's presence in existence, that sort of ripple effects through the entire system and Hashem's presence now becomes more augmented in all of the existence. So you can think of yourself as like a little, a little um, we'll call it a little consciousness hub. Imagine like a network of consciousness where each of us is a little hub of consciousness and every fragment of consciousness is kind of like a, yeah, they have consciousness. Um, it's a little different, but it, they do have it. Um, every, every fragment of consciousness is kind of like um, channeling or, yeah, they have self-awareness. It's just, it's just a little bit different than ours. Um, every fragment of consciousness is kind of like, um, almost like, think of it as a signal even. You have like, you have like the source consciousness and you have like um, a wire 
and you have another fragment, and that fragment sort of like takes the consciousness that's being transmitted, the, like the, the signal, and it enhances it, and then it shoots down to the next person and it enhances it to that person. That person then also builds it out, and you have this whole network where everybody's kind of magnifying and sharing the consciousness, and that ripples through the entire system very quickly, by the way. And so that's really what we're talking about. Every individual hub is energized and then also energizes other hubs. And so that's essentially what the Zohar is talking about here. The concept is that you do exactly the same thing with Hashem. And it's very important to actually um, know who Hashem is in order to do that. It's kind of, if you don't know who Hashem is, then you're going to have a very hard time. It's kind of like getting married to somebody who you don't know, never meet, never speak to, and never encounter. That's going to be a serious impediment to your connection. Okay, so... That's basically now sort of taking it to the Hashem side of things. Now, after all of that, um, what I want to sort of talk about now is what exactly tefillah is in the world of the analogy and how to use it. So here's the thing. The thoughts and actions and the speech, which is kind of like the, it's a little bit in between things, so I didn't really want to reference it. It's not really its own category so much here. Um, it's useful in a certain way. It has to do with the mind, and we're going to kind of leave it off the table because it's going to confuse too much. Um, the thoughts and actions, while they are very significant in terms of emphasizing and, and kadoshifying, in other words, enhancing and expanding the das, so, but the thing that is important here is the das. In other words, the das is the purpose. Okay, so like, in other words, that background hum, like that's the whole relationship. So, you know, just to quote, like as, a, as an example, whenever we engage in the process of tefillah, so we're always, we're always trying to talk to Hashem. If you go back to our relationship, in other words, you never talk to Elohim, you never talk to Kel, to Kel Shakai or Tzvakot or any of the other names, you never talk to any of the other midos of Hashem, um, you're only talking to Hashem, the, the self that is behind all those things. The analogy for that, the same exact thing is true in terms of the relationship um, between two lovers who are in a, in a dedicated context, what we call Kedushin. Um, so you're interested in, in, in her. You're not, like, obviously there's all these different things that your significant other has and does and, and brings to the table, like, you know, tools that she brings with her, he brings with him, but you're not interested at the core in those things. When you are interested at the core in those things, we call that objectifying somebody. So that's not what you're looking for. You just, you obviously, it's nice to have those things. You know, like you, you want to have somebody who, let's say we use a shallow example. You marry somebody that has money. So like, that's a useful tool, which if you don't get, if you don't get fixated on it and marry them because they have money, then it can be very useful to have a, a, a person who has money in your life because then you can do things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise and potentially enhance your life and your, your relationships, that whole background hum that we're talking about. But if you marry them because they have money, then what you're doing is you're now, it's, it's what's called ahava hatsluya badavar. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a connection that essentially is built on top of something. And then that something disappears. People lose their money all the time. Um, unfortunately, it's happening now uh, to a lot of people. Um, then that can really undercut the entire relationship and sort of show that you were never really connected to them at the root level in the first place. So the point is that the da'at itself, that background Piece, the white, the whiteness of the whiteboard is the actual relationship. Everything that you put on top of it, the different actions that you take, different thoughts that you think, they're all transient. It's true they can be used if you could doshify them to enhance the whiteboard, to bring it more into your consciousness, to feel her more, to feel Hashem more. It's true you can do that, but they're all transient things. They're, they're things that you, you have time of your life and you use that time potentially to do that, to feed the, the das, and the das will expand. But if you don't feed it, then it will not, then it will contract. But anyway, you slice it, the das is the point. That background thing is what it's about. So now we have to understand exactly like, well, what exactly like, is that background thing in the world of Chazal? Like what are the terminologies and how do we, how do we harness that? So that background thing, we talk about tefillah. So tefillah is what's called avodah shabalev. It's a Gemara in Tainus, very beginning. Um, avodah shabalev, so... Avodah Shabalev essentially refers to avoda, means things that you can do, but it's balev, it, meaning we're going to translate that for now as inside of the heart. Okay, so in other words, general mitzvot, actions that you take are called avoda. But then there's, a, there's one particular avoda that's called avodah Shabalev, where you do something that's internal, internal tinkering. So by the way, um, 
the world of uh, the world of the lave is associated always with thoughts, and we're going to sort of show why that is in a second. I already kind of alluded to it before when I said things that you think are always flowing from the underlying perceptions, under, underlying deot that you have. When you do avodah lave, so you're trying to do something that's on the inside, and it specifically relates to the world of thought. So, so tefillah is is called avodah shabalev because it is some kind of internal thing that you're doing, some kind of internal avoda. So number two, I want to sort of just to build on top of that, is that this, this avoda shabalev is something which is usually described as being underneath all of the mitzvot that you do. In other words, whenever you're doing an avoda of mitzvot in some way, the avoda shabalev is supposed to be going on underneath it. In other words, any action you do is supposed to be containing a component of, of, of avoda shabalev. So if you think about that, that's kind of obvious, right? Like we said earlier, if I buy her flowers after two years, I'm doing that every week, and there is no longer going to be an internal process where the, where the buying of the flowers creates a reinforcement and enhances the day of, the, of, of her presence in my being, that is a failure for there to be any kind of internal component being developed as a result of the external component. So if you think about that in terms of, 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 in terms of what tefillah is, so what we're basically describing here is what, li- what really links your actions and your thoughts in a, in a system to the background das. That's really what I'm trying to show you guys, trying to build for you. Because what's supposed to happen is that you do an action and then you have thoughts that cascade automatically from that action and they then reinforce a particular perception. And then you can, so that, that's every mitzvah is supposed to work that way. That's what's called having kavana in a mitzvah. When you have kavana, it means you're supposed to be thinking the thoughts that are what the mitzvah is about. But then the, if you just take the lev component, the kavana component, and you get rid of the actions, and you just zero in on the, on the, on the, on the, on the lev side and, ch- and don't do any kind of action, what that would look like in a relationship with your, with your beloved is basically going off to the side by yourself, I don't know, going for a walk by yourself, and just spending time thinking thoughts about the other person, like on purpose, not because your, your perception is there and now the thoughts are kind of like welling up anyway. Some of it will be that. But even more than that, you'll have thoughts that you're now going to purposely follow and invest time in and like expand them out. So it's kind of like, you know, let's say, let's say your spouse does something really nice for you. you know, it's your birthday and they, uh, get, they, they, just, they make you a surprise dinner. And then afterwards, you spend time doing avoda shebelev in terms of that, the, 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 the de'a of, of, that, of your spouse. So you go for a walk. And you're just like, you're so happy. You feel, you feel her presence and you, or his presence and you have the thoughts that are coming out of that. And then, but you're just walking and let's say you're not thinking actively. Your mind can just wander eventually to other things and back and forth and in, in the daydream. Or you can let your mind actually, you can decide to turn your mind directly towards thinking about it and then starting to imagine on purpose all the things she must have had to do or he must have had to do to construct that thing that, that they did for you. And then you, and you, and you flesh it out. Right? Like you really, you really think it through. And then it's like that will lead to a much more enhanced perception because now the presence of the other person is much more um, uh, vibrant and, 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 and intensified because it's like, oh, whoa, like now I really see what they did. And then what will happen, by the way, as a result of that, of Vodash that you just did, as you go back to them and then you start talking to them about that, and that will also build you know, actions and speaking that are essentially extensions of those thoughts will, will then further enhance that. So what a Vodash is, essentially is doing, doing the internal tinkering that usually happens as a result of actions that you take without having any actions. You're purposely going into the world of your thoughts and then trying to build them out in order to directly um, enhance and expand the das that's in the background. That's what you're trying to do with Avodah Shabalev. Okay, so that exact thing, um, when you do that effectively, when, you're, when you have a to go back to our original, original point, if you remember way back in the beginning, when you're able to do that, so then what you're doing is you're basically trying to, I mean, what you're, you're, let's even say it like this. You're trying to distinguish, or I'm trying to distinguish right now, between Kedusha and a totally different concept, which is called Dvekut. Because Dvekut, Dvekus, um, it usually means, it literally means gluedness. Gluedness, that's a pretty good word. I like that word. Um, gluedness means that you're basically um, attached to the person. What that looks like when you're, when you, when you kadoshify yourself to somebody, you can create a situation where now there is this ongoing natural trend of kadoshification towards them. And then that makes the das very vibrant and the das 
essentially continuously becomes incrementally every day a little bit more vibrant. That's what dvekut, dvekus, looks like. Because what dvekus is, the opposite of dvekus is where basically if you're not kadoshifying enough, you're not dedicating, you're not, you're not dedicating the thoughts intrinsically with avodah believe, or you're not even doing actions that might do that, or you're doing actions but there is no underlying kavana, there's no underlying lave part involved. So what happens is then the the background that background whiteboard just slowly becomes more and more in the background. In other words, there's a, there's a there's a diminishing or a detaching or a distancing that takes place. So dvekus is when there is a constant process of that becoming more and more and more vibrant as a result of your kadoshification. Okay, so that's basically what it is with people, and with Hashem, it's exactly the same thing as that, um, because what avodah should believe is. Is, is, is again, I don't even want to use the word tefillah because tefillah is confusing. Tefillah is like, oh, we do tefillah three times a day and we go to shul. I want you to understand that on, in, in every setting, whatever action you are doing, you are doing actions that have an underlying kavana component. They're supposed to, and if they don't, that means you're living mindlessly in that particular moment. And that's, that's a state of tefillah. It's a state of avodah believe that we just stated. And you can also do it even when you're not doing any actions, you're just sort of letting your mind do its thing or, or, or turning your mind on purpose towards Avodah should believe dynamics. So that's something which you can do all the time. And when you don't do, when, you, when your mind is, is um, essentially just doing its own thing, then you're letting the vibrancy slowly fade in whatever relationships that you have, including the Hashem one, which is the meta one. And then there's all these patchwork subcategory relationships that are on the whiteboard also that are fading somewhat as a result. I want to just, um, I want to just say just um, one side point in that, in that thing, which is that um, it doesn't mean you have to always be constantly doing Avodah believe on purpose because we have this concept where you're, you're mevat el Torah sometimes in order to be makai in the Torah. It's just not as let your mind wander in order to get better at that. You know, it's like if you have to constantly spend every second investing in your relationship with your spouse, you're going to go crazy because your particular setup right now, you only have limited power. So you can't operate unli- with unlimited power. But besides that, taking breaks and resting in that way to sort of refresh the, the process, um, you're supposed to largely try to invest in this constantly. I just want to mention here also, for those who have ever seen this before, uh, there's a book called Olas Haraya, which is the, it's the Rav Cook's Sitter. It's an incredible book, un- unbelievable book. Um, but the whole first, the introduction to that book is an essay essentially describing how you are, how you are in a constant state of tefillah, uh, which is what I just described essentially. In other words, you're in a constant state. The Neshama is constantly trying to enhance the vibrancy of Hashem's presence in its, in its consciousness and, you know, you can get in the way of that by training yourself to basically detach from the neshama and think things that violate it. But assuming you let it just do its thing, um, that's why I said before, if you have a yearning to be an interior designer or to be an artist of some, of some kind, so then you should, you should feed that a little bit because it means the neshama is trying to connect to Hashem in some way and it's trying to burst out. And if you just like, you know, try to externally um, block that, then you're going to cause real damage to the neshama in that way. So... Okay, so that's basically what tefillah is and what avodah should believe is. And that's, by the way, why the word, um, okay, whatever, we'll leave that aside, aside for now. But that's basically um, when, what, what the vekut is. So now let's sort of take all of that and take it to our actual question, which we now have one minute left to answer this question if we're going to keep it under an hour. Um, the actual question was, why do we do tefillah and how does tefillah and, and tehillim help when people are sick in the world? Okay, so in order to answer that, I have to just show you guys one other thing. Um, this is another statement from, uh, this is actually just straight enough Shachayim um, paragraph. It's in Shar uh, Bey's also uh, Parakid Aleph. Um, and this is something which we have in the text of our, um, of our tefillah a lot of the time, especially if, for example, in Elokai Netzor, we say this, that when you engage in the process of Avodah believe, you're not doing it for, uh, you're, you're doing it for the following reason. Nef Shachayim writes this, he writes like this, he writes, um, Pasuk Zeh Ramaz Ha'ikar Agadol Shal Inyan tefillah. the main idea of tefillah, which is hinted in the previous section, which we're going to ignore for right now, um, what, how Avodah Shabalev works. Sheklal Kavanasahu, the main um, thinking or the main thought process you're supposed to be having here, Lechavein Rak Lehosif Koach Bikdusha, that the point of tefillah, the process of Avodah Shabalev, is designed to add strength to the, to the power of, the presence of Kedusha. In other words, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build Das of Hashem. Right, well, you're trying, like I said before, you're trying to essentially create more direction of Kedusha towards Hashem. And that then brings the Das more into its vibrancy. And so tefillah very often is thought about as, um, you know, as prayer, which means asking God for things. But we say, when we say, so we say, like, do all the things that I asked, not because I want them, 
but really for your sake. Now, what does it mean for your sake? So if you think of God as some guy in the sky and he's like, you know, the all-powerful tyrant who is uh, keeping you down in some way, so that's going to be a seriously problematic thing to deal with because it's like, well, you know what, God, forget me. I'm not important. Things that I care about, the, all the people that are in pain or through that I'm afraid of losing in my life in difficult time periods, like, well, I'm not important, but you are, so do it for you. Like, that's a very messed up way of thinking about things. Um, but if you think about it as that there is a whole process here where the, the, the background of existence is Hashem's being. So then we start to think of like, okay, so like what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to enhance that. I'm trying to bring Hashem's presence into the world. There was never, there was ever an idea of like, oh, I'm asking Hashem for things. And it's like, I want him to do what I want. The, the, the background assumption of the Torah perspective of what tefillah is, is that Hashem is doing his thing. And we are a part of that. And the question is just trying to understand like, well, what should we do in situations where our part is experiencing pressure like we're having right now with this whole coronavirus thing. So it's about cre- increasing the Kedusha dynamic. So just go a little further for a second. Um, I'll also mention one other thing. There's also another Zohar here, which I just think is a, a good example of this, um, which is just in terms of what tefillah does and how it, like, wh- like what it's supposed to do. So the Zohar here that he quotes is uh, on page, uh, it's also in, in, in Shar Beis Perak Yud, so when a person says the words of tefillah, so when you take the things that we say, Hashem builds out existence. In other words, he essentially is, he's becoming more manifest in the, in the, in the existence that we are a part of, in the story. J.K. Rowling suddenly becomes more powerful as a character in the book. So let's say she's like a certain amount of presence, and then, you know, people relate to her in a certain way they feed her presence and then she's somehow more manifest and if she's the author she can change things in the book but just so that, that that's supposed to be what's supposed to happen is like we're feeding that so with all of that in the background more background now um so the uh the first thing i want to say is that there's a mafurish gemara in masechus brachos um that is on daf Ahmed bays i'm not mistaken i'm a bays which discusses how there's something called Ion Tfila, which is where you try to look to see if you get what you asked for. The Gemara says you're not supposed to do that. It causes a lot of problems to do what's called Ion Tfila. Ion Tfila leads to a lot of negative issues. There's some uh, Gemara Baba Basra also that Tosfos there quotes that talks about the problems of Ion Tfila. Not to be confused by the, the other kind of Ion Tfila. There's Ion Tfila where you're trying to actually understand your Tfila. And Ion Tfila, Ion Tfila literally means delving into your Tfila. So the Ion Tfila the Gemara is talking about in Brachos is where you're trying to delve into your tefillah means looking to see if you're going to get what you asked for. Mitzap eliros masayevo. You're trying to see when you're going to get what you asked for, and that's very problematic. We do not do that because that is not the purpose of what tefillah is. That is something which um, it's easy to fall into that, and the Gemara there deal, describes the process of how easy it is to get into that headspace. Um, but that's not really what we're dealing with here. That's not what, that's not what tefillah is about. So let's now deal with the question of, well, when you actually say a tefillah for somebody who is sick, what exactly is happening? So like I said before, you could sort of think of it as like, um, when you engage in Avodah Shabalev in real tefillah, real tefillah, where you're actually enhancing the das, where you're digging in to make the presence of Hashem vibrate more powerfully, so it increases the background hum of Hashem's presence in existence, which essentially can be described another way as it increases the quality of the connection between us and Hashem and between us and each other. And in a regular relationship between two people, that's kind of like, like I said, like, as I keep using the analogy, it's like this sense of like, wow, I feel so close to you. Again, using the example of the surprise party where you did that kind of thinking afterwards, you can feel so free and vulnerable and close by engaging in, in real um, avodah shabalev, as opposed to just doing something nice on the outside externally without the accompanying underlying avodah shabalev, will just be a little bit empty. It'll just feel like it's a nice thing, but it's like, you know, I think a lot of people feel that way with school. When schools do nice things, people kind of feel like, well, you don't care about me as a person because we don't have a real personal relationship. We have a, it's a, a student, um, you know, in a school relationship. That's why in the school that I teach and sometimes people are a little bit, you know, they feel like the school does something that's a, a program. It's fun, but it's not like, you don't feel the, like, and there's a lot of love in there, but it's not like, it's not like a personal, like if somebody was married to you and like they did uh, something for you that was really, really personal, it's so much more personal. There's so much more vibrancy of the das in the background as a result of that. So that's what you're doing with, with a believe. You're trying to increase that connection um, in the world in that way. And when you have that vibrating through existence in an intense, in a new way that it wasn't five minutes ago, people are going through genuine tefillah. What that does is you can think of it as it shifts the trajectory 
of existence because Hashem's, like, and again, this requires more background information, but existence has a, a trajectory. It's trying to get somewhere. And when things happen, like hypothetically, if there's a world where people are fragmenting intensely and they're becoming more and more and more polarized against each other and separating from each other and viewing each other as completely unable to be related to what we call the Facebook phenomenon, right? If that's happening in the world, that can seriously shift. The, that, that means that there's a shift in the trajectory of existence away from where Hashem is taking things. And then I'm not saying this is the reason why the coronavirus happened, but I am saying that anytime anything happens in existence, so the reason why tefillah is a, is a response is because you're just trying to bring more vibrancy of Hashem, which then shifts the trajectory of the world in some way. You won't know how it shifts it because you're not doing Ion tefillah. You don't know that what you're doing is going to directly change the situation of this particular person right in front of you. But you don't have control of those things. You don't have control of individual events in existence. What we can do is we can operate as hubs for Hashem's presence and then vibrate Hashem's presence into existence more and more fully and make J.K. Rowling more powerful in the story. And actually that shifts things in ways that we won't know. And sometimes it can shift it in a way that will ripple effect and ultimately change the particulars of the people in our lives that we wanted to change. And it can make people then who are sick, not sick, or all kinds of other examples of things that are just like that. So that's really what's happening. You can just think of it as like, you shift, when, when, when the reality kind of goes off the rails a little bit, so it's, it's yearning to sort of, it's always yearning to sort of go back towards Hashem. So what we're doing is we are trying to fix the dislocation or just, or, or not just fix, we're trying to add to the presence to, to sort of adjust that. And so, like we said, mitzvot and, and Torah, are essentially actions and thoughts and you want to tie them together and then build them out to actually impact the das side of things. And when you do that, that creates more genuine dvekut with Hashem. And so when you do that whole thing, whether you're just focusing on the avodah believe on the internal side, or you're doing the actual mitzvah lifestyle things and thinking thoughts by learning Torah that are extensions of that. So learning Torah is very ex- 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 important, by the way, because learning Torah trains your mind to think things out all the way. So you, you want to, just like when you're thinking out how she had to plan the surprise party, well, it's hard to think out fully when you don't have a lot of training and thinking. But if you have a lot of training, thinking out implications of everything, so then, you know, that's, that's what learning Torah does, then you can do that with anything. And specifically you should do with people in your life and imagine all the layers and, and nuances of what they had to put together in order to do whatever they just did. That creates a very intense uh, increase in das of another person and also similarly with Hashem. So that's essentially um, what tefillah is supposed to be. And I'm going to now just say one last comment about Tehillim, and then we'll take questions. So the Tehillim comment, uh, there's a lot of people who say Tehillim now, and is it, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that, God forbid, or anything like that. Um, but what Tehillim is supposed to be is, it's supposed to be somebody else's thoughts, taking, taking ideas about Hashem, and doing what I just described, thinking them out extensively, but not just any someone, someone who had a very intense, in love and I, I, I don't know how to say this more graphically. I want to say it as graphically as I can because I want you to feel what this is. Like, like if you think of like the love that you could have for another person, you know, like, the, a, like a, a true love relationship um, where there's just this intense wrapped upness in them. So there's three genders, you guys know. There's males, females, and a shem. And the third gender is uh, just as attractive. Actually, the third gender is way more attractive. Like the Hashem gender, it's crazy. Like if you think that the male-female attraction is intense, the Hashem gender is cracked out. It's like way beyond anything you can imagine. So, um, and you feel it, by the way. You just don't realize you're feeling it all the time. It's like when you open the fridge and you can't figure out what you want in the fridge, that's a little bit of like the Hashem gender. Um, but like the point is that like, th- like the people, who, the, the, essentially David Amelech and a couple other people who also were involved in the Tehillim process and the Tehillim writings, um, that's really someone spelling out all these thoughts. So I'm going to give, just give you an example here for a second. Oh, I had a, te- I had a Tehillim thing that I wanted to show you. Right. I had one, I promise. You know what? Here, this will do just as good. Um, so, but basically that's the point of this. Like saying Tehillim, it's supposed to be thoughts that will flesh out who Hashem is in that kind of way and make it very... Holy cow. <laughs> We're live here. It's, just, it's not good. Um, so the problem, of course, with saying Tehillim, by the way, Nefshachim in Shardalid talks about how Tehillim is, is a very intense version of Dveikos to Hashem, because essentially it's what we just said. It's a Vodasha believe. You're literally taking thoughts, putting them into your mind in order to enhance the vibrancy of the background. 
If you don't know what the Tehillim says, though, it's not going to work so well, and the English translation is not going to cut it, because the words, everything I just said, this entire last hour and 10 minutes, um, was those concepts are embedded in these words. It's like, it's not, I don't, and I don't mean like indirectly, they're, they're in the words. So just we'll pick one, like, okay, the, like the Halalukas, you know, Tukit Zimra, Halaluka, Halalina Nafshiyas Hashem, okay? So the word Halalu, and then the name Yod and Hey, so the word, the word Lehalel essentially means to reflect. And then the word, the Yod and Hey means two components of Hashem's presence as he channels himself into existence. So, and we have to build that out also, obviously, but like when you know what those words mean, so basically I'm saying now I'm trying to sort of reflect Hashem's, the beginning of Hashem's translation process into being. So you start off with that word and you say, Halina Shi is Hashem. But now my nefesh is, gonna, is also going to try to reflect Hashem. So the nefesh, you have to know what that is. That's kind of, the nefesh is kind of like the most um, inert part of your, of your sense of self. So your sense of awareness has a very basic um, sense of being. And what you're doing, you're saying, even at that most, at the bottom part of the, of the chain of existence that you are, even that part is now going to reflect back and sort of reflect Hashem's presence into being. Okay, like, so when you read those words, like you're getting into the headspace of this whole class. You understand? Like, you're not just saying to Hillam, like in a vacuum, like, oh, let me say these words and someone's going to get better. Like, you're literally activating the Dveikos process and making the background whiteboard hum. And you go a little further, right? Ahala Hashem Bechayai. I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use my, my life. That, like my, the word chayim means my animated existence in, in the world. That I can make change happen and I can, I can be present in, a, in an animate way from the word chayim. So I'm going to now reflect Hashem through that. So the things that I'm doing are now going to be kedoshifying towards Hashem in the way that creates more dveikos. Azamra lechai beodi. So the word azamra and the word lezamer, which means it's usually translated to sing. Azmora means like a sap, like a branch. So when, you, when you're a zomer, a tree, you're basically like, you're, you're, you're like, a, you're, what's the word for that? Pruning it. So that's because when you're creating songs, so what you're doing is you're basically trying to, you're, you're, you're moving things out. You're, you're homing in on particular um, sounds you want to create and they are very channel. That's why music is very, it's a discipline. It's very artistic and passionate, but it's very disciplined and very channeled because otherwise it doesn't work well together. So I'm going to, I'm going to now sing to Hashem, le, le Elokai, which is the source of my power, the word Elokim. So we're saying now, I'm going to, I'm going to now sort of discipline myself towards the, the source of my power, who is also manifest as a, as Elohim also means power that's in existence, the OD with all of my, with all my being, like with all of my, my, whatever the word for that, the OD, it's hard to translate. So like, these are like, you know, oh, we'll go on actually. Don't, don't trust and rely on people who are kind of volunteering to, to be there for you, right? We call that, we call them friends. And friends are great, and you're supposed to have friends, and you're supposed to try to, kenele chachaver in Pirkei Avos means you should try to um, buy a friend, means try to create a situation in which there's as much reliability as you can create with, an, with a particular person who is one of these nidivim, who is also called bevein adam she'en a person who has no real, they don't have real permanence. In other words, don't try to just rely on people who are impermanent, but it's so easy to do, right? We do this all the time. We just kind of, we, we count on people, we count on friends and family. And again, it's not that you shouldn't count on them at all, but there should be this background awareness that they're part of a patchwork and there's a much larger one which never changes and people are, are ben adam shenon teshuah. So what happens when his ruach leaves the kli that we use? And again, you can think about what that is. So then, then the person will sort of fade out of the picture, will return to the ground. Adama literally means from the word adam, which we have to figure out what that is. And then all of his like, all of his different calculations and plans are going to disappear. So like these are thoughts that are of a particular genre that are going to access headspaces that you can use to create more vibrant awareness of Hashem. By the way, there's all kinds of different ones, right? Every paragraph of Tehillim has its own theme and has its own, its own nuances. And again, a lot, of the, a lot of the individual ideas in different parts of Tehillim are going to be overlap because you know, certain themes are, certain um, elements are obviously central and repeating. But like this one is a little bit more like, you know, um, focusing at first on people are not, you know, reflect Hashem, not people. And then it says, Ashrei She'el Yaakov Be'ezro. So yeah, you know, like a person will, you'll, you'll, uh, the word Ashrei from the word Osher means you're going to have a lot of what it is that you want. Um, when El Yaakov, the power of Yaakov, Yaakov is a person, Yaakov is, is referenced here not as Yisrael. Yaakov means the follower version of, of Yaakov Yisrael, meaning the person who is more, he was, he was in Parshas Vayetze, Yaakov is kind of like a, a victim mentality more. He's more of like a, He's trying to become Yisrael, not ready to do it yet. And El Yaakov means the, the power that, that, that was supporting him in that time. 
So that's what we're talking about here, right? Like a situation where you basically have to realize like you, you can't count on other people fully. And you have to sort of like in your, in your, in your nef, in your naf show, in your needy place, you got to like lean on the power that is Hashem. And so you roll Hashem you, and you're, you're looking towards Hashem who is your Elohim. Even the phrase Hashem Elokav is like a key phrase. Hashem Elokim is like a, it's like, is central to the whole Chumash. And this whole thing, the whole paragraph reads like that. And it's all part of these same themes. But when you are just reading, like, the reason why I switched Sudurim is because I have, of all the Sudurim I picked off the shelf. I picked this one by accident. And this one looks like this on the inside. In case you're not sure what, why I had a problem with it. See that? That is a Matsuda sitter. And Matsuda sitters are very confusing for me because there's so many English words that I don't know what's going on. Um, and again, I'm not saying that's bad. It's important to try to use whatever tools you can. If you don't know Hebrew well right now, um, then you should first learn it in English and then try to do what I just did. Like, you know, the word halalu means praise usually. That's how it's translated. And then you, you ask somebody, you learn about it, you read different, different commentaries, and you can expand these perspectives. So that's what Tehillim is supposed to be. It's thoughts and you can now impregnate your mind, make your das be- of Hashem become more vibrant that way. And it's the reason why the Nefesh Chaim said it's such a strong vacos is because you're literally thinking like the thoughts of somebody else. And, if you, and, and the words are keyed to the underlying meanings. So you can actually access David HaMelech's like passionate love affair with Hashem through the words that capture exactly what he was experiencing, unlock all of that, and then create your own vacos in your das of Hashem. That's crazy. So yeah, of course you should do that. That's a great thing to do. And the more you do that in a real way, so then, yeah, we'll all have a much better world. You know, if we could bring Hashem perspectives like that into the world, I mean, that's the whole reason why I'm building this website. Like, literally, like, the, the amount of damage that's going on in the world just on a regular basis because we are shallow or we don't connect to each other, we don't learn each other deeply, we don't listen deeply, we're constantly listening to attack. That's literally what Facebook is, listening to attack. And everything is about trying to find a way to say that somebody else is wrong and polarizing everybody and no one can understand anyone. And it's not just Facebook. I mean, this is like a, this has been going on for a long time, but it's just now much more um, rampant. I mean, like imagine if we impregnated people's minds uh, with ideas that were so much, so different from that and were true and, and, and healing and, and help people to become much more connected. Of course, that would change the trajectory of the world in an intense way. And yeah, that also means that in your little individual space, if you have a person who God forbid is also sick, so, you know, you're, you're trying to energize your immediate surroundings with more Hashem consciousness, and there's no way to know how that's going to influence the reality. And it's very possible people around you who are sick will become massively healed by that. And yes, there's plenty of times where that happened and plenty of times where it didn't. And we're not directly in control of that, but there's, it's always good to do that. And that's what the whole point here is, because the, the trajectory of existence is supposed to be more genuine connection with Hashem in that way. And so I'll end with the following um, thought which is in case you ever wondered why it's been so hard for people to have Kavana and Tfila for the last few hundred years, I think you now know the answer to that question because the, 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 there's a whole structure to this. You have to really know how it works. And fundamentally, at the very root of it, since Dveikus, that background presence, the Das of Hashem, is the, like I said, it's the main thing, right? The, the mitzvot and the machshavos, the thoughts and the actions are, are tools towards that. But the main thing is the connection side of things. Well, if there is no Hashem for you because you think Hashem is a guy in the sky um, or some other, you know, permutation of Christian ideology or whatever, and you don't have the Torah as the book that tells you how to think about Hashem because it's the book about Hashem. So then there is no way to create a Das of Hashem. There's no way to create a Das of Hashem. And there's no way to ever build that feedback loop where there's an expansion of that Das and increasing connection. And so then of course you're going to feel like, you know, that tefillah is, is, is empty and if you don't know what the words mean, then you don't even have that tool either. So you're kind of, you're, 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 you're lost at both ends on that one. And so that is, I think, why specifically today it's so hard to engage in tefillah. Um, it's also been hard for many centuries because people have really struggled with the whole framework I just described because for the same reason, it's very hard to genuinely connect at a deep level with anyone without really developing the tools. And so only people who learned about the tools, which is essentially what the Torah is about, and then invested in them consistently over time, we're able to do that. And it's very much in our, in our reach now because, you know, thank God we live in a world where we have a lot of room for, for wisdom. We live in a wisdom world now. It's a, another Dor Hadea, literally. So Dor Hadea from what we just said, this, this is the time period where you can really begin to invest in that. And um, when you do that, so then the Kavana space can, can really return to what it used to be back in the, uh, you know, pre based on those time periods and Harsinai and whatever. And that's what we've been trying to do forever. So that's basically my parting thought. And uh, I hope that was relatively clear. And we will now take questions. Anyone wants to go home. Um, again, you are home. 
And if you would like to get off though from Zoom, you're welcome to do that too. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, let's do some questions. <laughs>